Hello and welcome to the lecture on Louis-Marie Chauvet's The Sacraments, The Word of God at the Mercy of the Body. In this uh, lecture I want to talk about Chauvet's use of the concepts of identity, language, and gift to explain sacramental theology in a new way, as well as his critiques of other understandings of sacrament. I think that um, there are two, under, two uh, quotes from this book that I really think that we should focus on and, and use as a way of understanding the whole book. One is on that subtitle on the, on the front cover, The Word of God at the Mercy of the Body. Um, in other words, the sacraments for Chauvet are uh, God's way of putting... Um, putting grace at the mercy of the body, in other words, making the body a way of grace. Um, the second quote, or the other way that, place that he says this, is on page 12 of the introductory material. The fact that Christian identity cannot be separated from the sacraments, in particular those of initiation, means that faith cannot be lived in any other way, including what is most spiritual in it, than in the mediation of the body. And he goes on to explain that it's not merely the individual body, but rather the body of a society, of a desire, of a tradition, of a history, of an institution, and so on. What is most spiritual always takes place in the most corporeal. And uh, this is um, an important point for him. Now, I want to point out that what he's saying here, faith cannot be lived in any other way including the parts of it that are most spiritual than in the mediation of the body. So he's not denying um, the spiritual reality, but rather saying that in order for the spirituality, the spiritual reality to be lived out in a really human way, there has to be um, bodily mediation. So... First, I want to give you a little bit of context. So these are, um, uh, this slide is going to deal with the concerns of postmodernism in general. Now, um, some of the concerns of postmodernism are very appropriate for theology. Some of the concerns of mo postmodernism are very challenging to, moder to, to theology. So we have some um, as a response to uh, postmodern concerns and then some things that where postmodernism has actually influenced the building of the theology in this book and in other books. Um, one example is, for example, Derrida writes about the fact that there's no such thing as a free gift. I'll be talking about this early, later on. Um, that is obviously challenging to theologies about grace. If there's no such thing as a free gift, then how do we understand um, the gift of God as gracious and gratuitous. I'll get to that in a minute. So postmodern concerns. First of all, postmodernism is very much concerned with epistemology. In other words, how do we come to know what we know? Um, one of the things that postmodernism recognizes, and this is number three here, is the that the subject himself or herself plays a huge part in determining what he or she can know. So what I know already, for example, um, ha for example, if I'm looking at um, the front side of a building and I don't know what a building is, I won't know what the back side of the building looks like. So this, um, this is a, a huge part of postmodernism, this understanding that we uh, we determine what we know already by what we already know we determine what we can know in the future so this affects and shapes our ability to know about God and also to know God because if we have predetermined in advance what God is allowed to be um, then we won't be able to see anything that contradicts those assumptions as God. So this is a concern that postmodern theology is very close to. 
Another thing that's important about postmodernism and one of the things that it often seems threatening to people of faith is that postmodernism contains a profound doubt about the trustworthiness of meta narratives. What this means, a meta narrative is like a big narrative that incorporates and explains all the events on a global level. So, for example, the salvation history um, is a meta narrative because it incorporates and explains um, all the events both in the Hebrew Bible and in today for those who believe in it. So this is what a meta narrative does. Within postmodernism, as a response to the awareness that I have, of course, my meta narrative, but then I've been I have that meta narrative and that's what I already know and it shapes what I'm in fact able to come to know but somebody else may have a different meta narrative that seems equally true to them because of this fact postmodernism has doubt about the trustworthiness of meta narratives in other words that doesn't mean you don't have a meta narrative but it might mean that you can't be quite as sure that your meta narrative is real some of the responses to this um, this doubt include playfulness, sometimes it's called irony, um, and sometimes it is ironic, but I think there are other ways that the playfulness um, manifests itself, and angst um, with response to meta narratives. And I actually have a, I'll admit, kind of whimsical example here. This is a, another webcomic that I like to read. Oh, didn't work, hang on. So here's the comic. Um, as you can see, there's these frames up here from the stories. I expected the world to be sad, and it was. And I expected it to be wonderful, it was. I just didn't expect it to be so big. In a sense, this is the, uh, the, the example I want to give here is, here's the comic. A comic is, you know, a particular way of framing um, something. But this particular comic, when it first appeared, as your mouse hovered over it, would say click and drag. That was the name of the comic. Um, and when you did that, you discovered that it broke your frame of what a comic was supposed to be. And in a sense, you could call this a playful response. But I want to show you the angst response. It really is very big. I guess I might as well show you the whole thing. But the people I want to find are down here in a cave. If anyone up th is anyone up there, if you can hear us, friend us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, please. The uh, angst of these young people and their uh, completely inappropriate response to their isolation is uh, part of the playfulness of this piece. But back to the slideshow. Um, so. There, uh, the, this is also an example of this doubt about meta narratives, because everybody in this comic has their own micro narrative. There is no overarching narrative unless you consider. I didn't expect it to be so big to be a meta narrative, which you could maybe. All right. So Chauvet wants to respond to this um, set of concerns. Sorry, I made that text kind of goes off this page. But he sees there um, three models in the history of sacramental theology um, by which we understand how the sacraments help us know about God and construct our knowledge of God. 
So the first model that he deals with and the second model are ones that I think we know um, quite well, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. And if you don't have it already, you might want to have your book with you because I'm going to go through and explain um, several of the um, of the diagrams that appear in this book. And so it might be helpful to be able to look at them on, within the context of the text. All right, so the three models. First, he sees as the objectivist, um, which is the model of Thomas Aquinas, he says, or also the model of Neotonism. Um, I think probably really more of Neotonism than Thomas Aquinas. In his first book, um, Symbol and Sacrament, which was also published at the Lit Press and is a, a larger book, um, he actually was quite a bit more critical of Thomas Aquinas and then the res in the response to that book, a lot of good Thomas said, um, look, what you're taking issue with is not actually Thomas Aquinas, but Neo-Thomism. And so in this book, we can see a correction <laughs> where he's uh, more careful about what he says about Thomas's own work. So, but he does say that in this first set of, in this first model or this set of models, the sacraments are regarded less as revelatory signs than as operative means of salvation, which is something we've talked about before. In other words, they act um, objectively on the recipient um, whose disposition is scarcely important and the grace that they bestow is more appropriately seen as a cause than as something that shapes their um, their mindset or way of life. All right. Two, the subjectivist set of models. Again, this is something I think um, that we're well familiar with. In fact, this is probably the specter that's raised for most of us when we think about postmodernism and a postmodern approach to the sacraments. Um, this uh, Chauvet calls our attention to Karl Barth and others. It's not actually the objective content of faith but one sincerity and good intentions that matter in the sacrament. This would be, uh, in a sense, the assumption that it's actually, you know, the sacraments are our way of reminding ourselves that God is very important and that we need to do these things. Um, Chauvet thinks this is equally dangerous, but also it's, in a sense, right. So we'll talk about why it's right in a moment, um, as the first one is also right. So then he says that these two are imbalanced and he wants to um, portray and that there is, oh, I should say, there's a uh, diagram on page 16 um, of the front matter that shows a diagram where the sacraments are the means between God and humankind. And in the objective pattern, the direction that God bestows grace on humankind through the sacraments is emphasized. And the one that humankind responds to God through the sacraments is de-emphasized. And then if you look at page 19 of the front matter, you will see the same thing. Okay. I didn't realize you had that one in there twice. So that's interesting. So 19, oh, I'm sorry, so the one on 19 um, shows how God gives grace to humankind and human beings then express their reception, reception of that grace through sacrament by which they sanctify their own um, daily existence. So he also thinks this is unacceptable, although it's partially true. In the Vatican II model, which has its um, diagram on page 24 of the front matter, um, he incorporates these both into a model, a triangular model. So in Vatican II, he says, the sacraments symbolically proclaim to the world what the church is. They attest it but they contest it in the very moment they attest it. So um, if we look about at this, um, you can see the two circuits. Um, we'll do the bottom one, the inside one first. So God bestows grace on the human beings through the sacraments 
um, in other words, the sacraments come from God and also lead human beings to give praise to God. That's how that A prime B C goes. Prime B time C prime. Then in A B C in the newer model, God is also always giving hu human beings sacra grace outside the sacraments, the experience of love, his love outside the sacraments, and out then human beings express that love in the sacraments and by that love return praise and glory to God. That would be the external um, part of the diagram. What this means to Chauvet is that the sacraments proclaim to the world what the church is. In other words, what the church already is, um, is made visible in the sacraments um, as far as the church is a living out in grace of God's own life that's visible in the sacraments. But it's also visible in the sacraments, or the sacraments also make visible the different ways that the church fails to be um, God's presence in the world. And so his examples are, um, as we serve the uh, handicapped or uh, children or teenagers or um, the homeless, it becomes clear to us not only how we are, but also how we are not yet the um, God's people and the work of God in the world. All right, so so then Chauvet wants to give us a uh, a response. His his concern is that even though um, in this by in the Vatican II model we have sign and cause closely integrated with one another, so that it makes sense. Um, that a sign in the sacramental sense would be also a cause or a change of the world. His critique of this is that they're heterogeneous. They are not, they don't function the same way. Um, a sign is something persuasive um, and it's also something that only works for human beings. A cause is coercive and it's something that um, also works outside the human domain. And so he's concerned about this. Um, so he says that's a mistake it, because, and this is on page three, language is not an instrument but a mediation. So this is our first of our three major concepts that I'm going to explain in order to help you understand Chauvet. So language is not an instrument. In other words, it's not a tool by which I make sense of my world, but a mediation, in other words, the way my I actually come to know my world and it actually um, uh, determines how I can, what I can know in my world. So let's look at his two diagrams that deal with language. The first one is on page three, and in this first diagram, the subject sees the real, senses the real um, through his or her language and that knowledge of the real comes back to the subject in uh, arrow 2 here and now that the subject knows about the real then the subject expresses what he or she knows about the real in language. Um, this might be, or actually might not be, but Chauvet assumes it is, our um, our kind of a priori, um, un, unexamined assumption of how language works. Um, the problem with this assumption of la how language works is simply that it's not empirically true that this is how language works. So if we, you know, look at contemporary anthropology, for example, um, we know that our senses and our sensory reality is in fact determined by the language we know. So to use a simple example um, without going too far afield, um, people's ability to recognize different colors is determined by the names for colors that their culture uses. So if my culture has um, three words for color, which is quite, quite um, common in certain societies, then I can recognize three colors. In our particular culture, um, we have 
um, hundreds of different colors and most of us can recognize a few dozen colors. So that's one way in which language um, becomes an intermediary or a mediation by which I can determine what reality actually is. Um, there are other things, um, so for example, it's also known that uh, we recognize um, the things that we are seeing as we see them. We don't actually register the sensory input and then later um, analyze what is on the in the image that we've resolved, but rather we actually kind of go out in order to resolve our eyes follow the edges of the things that we're determining as things um, and uh, in, in that way also our preconception of what's there and our knowledge about what might be there to see determines what we can see. So in this second diagram which is on page 8, Chauvet um, kind of creates a visual reminder of this understanding of language. That language um, stands between, my language stands between me and reality in a sense and determines what I can know about reality. So, um, if that's true, then our language about God also stands in between um, who I am and what I can know about God. And I think at this point in the class that really shouldn't be surprising or, or um, at least not newly troubling, although it might still be troubling. Um, and quite rightly. So for uh, Chauvet, that means that the church as a cultural and institutional reality or a cultural and institutional um, layer of reality stands between me and what I can know of God and grace and sacrament. So, um, and he thinks this is a good thing. So on page 13, he says, the, cult, the sensible cultural institutional mediations, which, and he's been telling us, we normally are suspect of and we wish they weren't there. We don't want to have mediations in between us and God. Um, but on the contrary, we should no longer see them, he says, as obstacles which ideally should be surmounted in order for subjects to walk toward truth. On the contrary, they are, even in their very ambiguity, for they're necessarily ambiguous, the milieu within which human beings learn at their expense to accede to their own truth. In other words, I don't even have, I can't have my own truth. I can't even have an individualistic and subjective truth without the cultural institutions to which I belong. And by the same token, except to hear the call of truth, this is God's truth here, which is greater than themselves. So if the church then is one of these um, sensible, cultural, it's the um, subject to the senses here, not uh, not reasonable, cultural and institutional mediation according to which I can come to know God at all. And so I shouldn't resent it and think that I could somehow come to know God better on my own if the church would just leave me alone. So um, on page 25 in in this chapter of the Christian subject, the language and culture of the church, he does an exegetical piece that supports this. And as part of that exegetical piece, um, he decides at the top of page 25, you cannot arrive at the recognition of the risen Jesus unless you renounce seeing, touching, finding him by undeniable proofs. Faith begins precisely with such a rec renunciation of the immediacy of the see no, and with the assent to the mediation of the church. In other words, um, the knowledge of Christ that comes through the church's liturgy, um, the church's tradition, whoops, the church's scripture, is inevitable. And so there is no way to kind of get around that and get direct knowledge of Jesus. And in fact, it's a it's a temptation and a mistaken temptation for us to think that somehow we would have a surer faith if we had encountered um, the historical Jesus in, pres in person than we have through the mediation of the church. I'll let him finish the uh, more about that when you read it. But so he gets to this um, 
this structure of Christian identity on page 28. So, and first of all, um, in the larger book where he had more space, um, some of this is clearer. So I'm going to go ahead and explain how we should read this diagram. The S at the top of the um, the uh, triangle here is for sacrament. And both scriptures and ethics should also have, um, should be inside this church circle. I think this should be have an E here and an S here. So, um, in fact, in the bigger book, it's SC and E for scriptures and ethics, but they're all inside the church as, and you see the dotted lines, the cultural institution or the language that mediates the transmission of these things and and accounts for what they mean and how and even how they can be said. So here's how the church functions as a mediation according to um, Chauvet. And I think for some of you this will uh, be helpful for some of the questions you've been having. So first, here's Jesus Christ who transmits um, grace and the divine life to the church um, as mediating institution. And then in each person's life, the experience of that um, that grace or the divine life is worked out through sacraments, faith, and ethics. So one of the things that we see here is that um, the, uh, we'll do it this way. So in all these de um, debates about priority, our scriptures first and sacraments arise from the scriptures, um, do the ethics come first and then sacraments are, are relevant only in so far as they encourage people to do good. Um, how does this work? Um, what Chauvet has is he has a way in which it happens both ways. So the sacraments influence our understanding of the scriptures and in fact are what presents the scriptures to us, for example, in the lectionary readings and what marks out for us certain um, sets of readings as scriptures, as scriptures that should be read together and should be read against each other and interpreted together. Um, the scriptures then um, influence our understanding of ethics and it's the scriptures as read in this way through the different, um, through the different means of the church's worship that then influences us in our understanding of what the ethics of Christianity is or what we are called to specifically as individual persons. And then the ethical life leads back to the sacraments um, as a way of um, bringing the, the uh, good work to God as a sacrifice. Let me th see if I, I think he has a better way of putting this. Um, oh, so the, uh, the, look at it, the uh, testimony to the gospel by actions is our response to the scriptures. So the scriptures uh, flowing out of the sacraments um, enrich our faith, and that faith then produces in us a desire to testify, and we do that in part by our worship of God and our um, our praise of God in the sacraments. Simultaneously for Chauvet, the sacraments also um, encourage our ethical life, which then the ethical life um, sends us back to the scriptures for a renewed understanding of what it is that God wants in the world. So, for example, here's where um, the ethical questions that we have about the right ways of living in the world um, will send us back to scriptures um, as an attempt to find uh, direction for those ethical questions um, and needs that people have in the world. And then from there, the scriptures will bring us back to the religious um, or the, the sacramental or liturgical life of the church um, with a renewed desire to bring praise to God. So he sees these as three different poles of what the church does, and then he gives us examples of how if one or the other pole is overemphasized, so he says, for example, that 
um, traditional Catholicism has overemphasized sacrament at the expense of um, at the expense of scriptures and ethics, but there are also ecclesial groups that emphasize scriptures too much at the expense of sacrament and ethics, or that emphasize ethics too much at the expense of sacrament and scriptures. So I'll uh, I'll let you to read that, but his his idea that the church is a mediation is really a complex one. It shouldn't be oversimplified to the institutional church as a mediation, which is a, a uh, misunderstanding that I sometimes see of Chauvet. All right, so then Chauvet says that this, the uh, in other words, the goodness of cultural and symbolic mediations is why we need to move from sign to symbol um, in our understanding of sacraments. And this is, we're getting into the um, chapter, I think it's, that it was chapter two and three that are, I summarized on the last slide. We're now getting into the second part of the book, which begins with chapter four. Um, so first of all, a sign for Chauvet is something that communicates information. The sign belongs, he says, to the order of knowledge or information or else value. Um, so in other words, uh, a sign, a stop sign just tells me to stop. It doesn't give me any other information. It does, or it, I mean, it's, it's a communicator of necessary information. Um, it doesn't uh, affect my identity, he says. Whereas the symbol belongs to the order of recognition or communication between subjects as subjects and is outside the order of value. So he talks about that. Um, what's important about this is everything has for Chauvet both sign elements and symbolic elements, but looking at the sacraments as symbol is going to give us a better understanding of um, what it is that the sacraments do. So if we think of the sacraments as teaching me about God, um, then I'm treating them as in the order of sign. Whereas if I think of them as um, conversation between God and me, I will treat them more as symbol. So he goes on uh, to talk about how a symbolic speech act, so language act, I could be just communicating information to you. Um, but if I do a symbolic speech act, then I actually change my relationship to my world. So one liturgical example, which he doesn't use here, is to say, I believe in one God, Father the Almighty, and so on. Um, by making this speech act, I'm not merely conveying information about my internal state. In fact, um, in Christian tradition, even if you have doubts about your belief in God, you're still to say the creed because the creed is a change of my relationship with um, the confessional world or a reaffirmation, you might say, of my relationship with the confessional world. So I'm committing to believe this even if at this moment my internal state does not precisely, um, does not precisely reflect that belief. All right. So let's look at briefly at the aspects of symbol that he brings out on 84 and 85 and I'll attempt to apply them quickly to liturgy because this is one of the places where I think um, it can be difficult to do that. So um, this chapter he's only going to talk about symbol, he's not going to talk about the sacraments as symbol very much and so it's somewhat helpful to have the sacramental example and I'll try to use baptism since that's the uh, the uh, theme for our time together. So first of all, symbolization is not an act, is an act and not an idea. In other words, um, for baptism, it is the washing um, and not the concept of cleansing for sin that is the at the heart or the essence of what the sacrament is. Um, I'll skip the rest of that. And each of the elements of a symbol is relevant only its relation to the other or to the others. So in other words, all the pieces of the sacramental rite are symbols in as far as they relate to one another and they're not symbols in isolation. So what this means is, for example, um, this doesn't mean that if you have the baptismal font outside baptism, it ceases to symbolize baptism. What it means is that the uh, baptismal font outside baptism 
continues to carry the weight of all the other symbols of baptism. So, for example, of the Paschal candle and of the person who is to be baptized and of the profession of faith and all the other symbols that are associated with that. So each symbol, in a sense, holds relationally all the other symbols in it um, because they all symbolize in relationship to one another. We talked about that a little bit already in this course. Um, the third one, the value of the bill or the value of the symbol doesn't matter for the symbol to function. So in other words, um, what he's trying to get at here is that the uh, sacramental value is outside of our normal ways of um, evaluating things. And there are actually, and I have encountered before, critiques of this particular principle. So in some sense it's true, but in other senses it might be subject to critique. So um, for his example, um, it's not at commercial value. So in other words, um, you don't have to have a really fancy snazzy font with gems embedded in it to uh, be baptized. It's not any better of a baptism. Um, it's use value. Um, uh, dirty water is just as good as clean water to baptize. It's aesthetic value, you know, same thing. Uh, you can use a ugly font and you're still just as baptized. It's cognitive value. Um, in other words, let's see, what is it? Oh, yes. Um, you don't have to have a, uh, a having a doctorate in uh, Trinitarian theology does not necessarily um, make your baptism any more effective. Um, when, even though then somebody who only understands the words about the Trinity and not anything about what the Trinity is. And then finally, emotional value, uh, which is something we've talked about before. I may not be very excited about the liturgy and it might not really impact me emotionally that much, but it still could be very effective. All right. And then, um, footnote or uh, part D, um, that the uh, act of symbolization simultaneously reveals something about the relationship of the parts to one another and it changes the relationship of the parts to one another. So for example, when we baptize, we're both revealing something about um, this new baptizand um, and her relationship to Christ or his relationship to Christ and we're changing that relationship. So that is what he has to say about symbol. You can see that this is a pretty strong departure um, from uh, just a traditional causal understanding of the sacraments. Um, and it gives Chauvet a lot of places to think about language and how we use language to change our world. So here's um, on page 91 his summary of this section on symbol. He says, not only is language efficacious, but it is what is most efficacious. Now what he means here is obviously not it lifts more weight than a lever. Um, what he says he means is a symbolic efficacy, which for him doesn't mean a not real efficacy, as you should be able to guess by now. He says, such an efficacy does not designate, as in science or technology, a transformation of the world but a transformation of subjects, a work that is produced in them and allows them to accede to another way of being. Um, you, you can put this much more simply, and I think Mark Searle puts it more simply, um, that the work of the sacraments is not um, a change of condition of the subjects, but a conversion of the subjects. Conversion is something that changes our way of being. All right, so gift and return gift. There is a diagram that goes with this concept on page. An excellent question. Page 121. It gives us a sense of um, gift and return gift. So in this section, Chauvet actually moves from the understanding of the sacraments as things to the understanding of the sacraments as a gift exchange, um, a ritual in which gifts are exchanged between 
two persons. Um, so this goes with his understanding of language in that for him, um, language is a gift and a return gift. I give, a, I give myself or I expose myself to someone else by communicating and he or she um, responds and their, that response um, determines and alters our relationship with one another. So this understanding of mutual conversation is important to how Chauvet explains the sacraments. So he treats gift exchange, a gift exchange um, in the anthropological sense that he uses it in this chapter um, is not exactly like a, you know, a uh, white elephant sale. Um, although you could use a white elephant sale and analyze it with Chauvet's work and see where you got. Um, but a gift exchange is where I give a gift to another person and in their gratitude for that gift, um, they give some sort of return acknowledgement, even though the return acknowledgement isn't assumed to be equal in value of the gift at that point. If you're concerned about the value of the two gifts, the relative value, then you have something more like a barter exchange or an economic exchange. And Chauvet's really concerned about that. He's uh, really worried that um, we're going to see the sacramental exchange as um, an exchange of equal value in which we have to sort of somehow equal um, God's gifts, which of course is impossible. So um, the way he gives it in on page 121, um, that there needs to be, if you will, a moment of deferral. There needs to be a moment at which I feel obliged, um, not a seeking to repay, but the return gift is merely an expression of my gratitude and my obligation and not a, a way of kind of somehow um, returning the gift that was given. We can't do that. So um, if we look at page 121, um, for Chauvet, in every sacrament, there is a gift which is being offered by God to human beings. And then there is a moment of reception but the moment of reception is always um, motivating us to give a return gift, which may not, in fact, it's not for Chauvet normally a gift back to God. It's not even the Parisian worship that uh, Skilibix uses. Instead, the return gift is the life of love that I live with other human persons and my offering of myself to them that's my return gift to God uh, in gratitude for the gift that's been offered to me. So what this means um, for Chauvet is that there is this moment in the sacraments that he calls possession by dispossession. Um, and this relates to another concept in Chauvet's book, the presence in the absence or presence in an absence. Um, it also relates to the idea that the most spiritual is present in the most corporeal um, but um, we'll talk about that probably more in class. So um, for Chauvet, um, just to talk about this possession by dispossession, if I suppose I'm walking down a street and I see a, uh, I see, let's see, what is it I see? I see a chocolate cake by the side of the road and I snatch it and run home. Um, this is a possession on my part. I have a possession. The possession is a chocolate cake. I took it and I have it. Um, but for Chauvet, that's uh, not um, the way a gift can be possessed. I can't possess anything that was a gift that way or it ceases to be a gift. So if somebody gives me a gift and I snatch it and run home, um, I have failed to receive the gift. Instead, I have stolen or I have, uh, I have seized, I have taken possession of. And for Chauvet, it's very important that we don't, if you will, seize possession of the sacraments. Um, so the concern that he has about thinking that the sacraments are under our own power and that we're in control of them is a concern that by doing that, we will be seizing possession of grace. And if we do that, then it's no longer grace because it's not this free and gratuitous relationship to God, which is what um, grace ought to be. So um, instead, 
Chauvet thinks in our sacramental rites we have built in this moment at which we recognize that we have we don't deserve this gift that the gift is free and in fact we even build in um, a maybe a reluctance to receive the gift or a um, concern that we're unworthy um, like for example the Lord I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof um, in the Eucharist so there's this moment at which we um, deny our worthiness as a reminder to receive the gift as a gift and one that's beyond our deserving. Um, so it, this is what he means when he says that our rights um, take possession only by dispossession. And therefore, we, um, we recognize um, the absence as, of grace as a way of then recognizing or a allowing grace to be present as grace, as freely given as gift. All right, so this brings us to uh, the Paschal Mystery, which is um, really almost the last thing I'm going to talk about in this lecture. Um, so if you um, will talk in class about the his analysis of the um, Eucharistic Prayer 2 in chapter 7 um, but in his understanding of the Paschal Mystery which is diagrammed on page 160 um, what he's interested in here is historically the Incarnation has been at the center of sacramental theology which we've talked about before that the um, church is the prolongation of the earthly visibility of Christ, that the sacraments are the prolongation of the earthly encounters with the earthly Christ. Um, for Chauvet, instead, he turns to the Paschal Mystery as the moment at which God is, there's both a revealer and an agent of God in the world. So for Chauvet, the Paschal Mystery, in other words, Christ's suffering and death and resurrection, is a moment at which God reveals all of our expectations, all of our um, pre-existing language about God to be inadequate by, in a sense, subverting all our expectations of what it means to be God. And this is something we've talked about a little bit in class already, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the parable. But this is a, if you will, a parable, that concept of parable we just talked about should prepare you for this understanding of Paschal Mystery. So the Paschal Mystery reveals to us that God desires to be God, not in overflowing power um, or coercion or immortality or any of the other things that we might associate with God, but rather in suffering, um, powerlessness, and death. And that is, a, for Chauvet, not only a revelation of God's nature and the fact that God's nature is not at all what we would have expected, but it's also an agent. It changes the relationship of humanity and God, and it changes the meaning of death. And, and in fact, it changes death itself um, in that moment where uh, Jesus dies on the cross. So I'll, I'll let you... Um, read that part but then so for for Chauvet it's most important that the sacramental gift exchange um, reveals to us this God who is so in love that rather than be immortal and all-powerful God chooses to be mortal and helpless at our mercy so this is where um, we get that, again, that subtitle, The Word of God at the Mercy of the Body. So I hope these, this brief um, set of slides will help. I do also want to point out a correction of the text at the top of page 132. There is a um, diagram that it just, the printer just made a mistake, and it's right in the other book. Um, so he just has ecclesial body of Christ where in this particular um, diagram we should have the sacramental body and blood of Christ being given by God to us. So I hope that's helpful and I look forward to seeing you all in our next class meeting. Thank you.